So a bit of background here, I've been playing mellow percussion since 4th grade, and I played on this bell set, which was fine then, and I could play scales and all that I needed to on it, but now that I'm playing 4 mallets and repertoire for the marimba, all of that in high school, it wasn't working as well. So I've been wanting a marimba for a really really long time, but they're just too costly and it didn't seem realistic. Uh, this, uh, um Closure will be delayed, and we appreciate uh, all your understanding and flexibility uh, as we navigate these uncertain waters. So, I so we all know how that went. Uh, our school was closed for the rest of the year, and I had no access to my instrument. So I did a lot of research on the internet, and it turns out building a marimba is possible and feasible. So. I looked up how we might go about this, I found key dimensions, how to tune the keys, and with just that information, we started to run with it. So we just purchased some oak boards from Lowe's, I think we just got one board, and we tried to test some keys, test making some keys. So we cut them to their dimensions, according to the chart that we found online, and then I tried sanding them and tuning them. So this was the first result. And as you can see, we were getting results from this, so we were on the right track, and I was really excited. So on April 14th, we got the rest of the boards from Lowe's. I think we got about eight oak wooden boards, and we cut them down to size for each key. I had a chart, I went down with a pen, and my dad would cut them to the dimensions that I told him. Uh, so it was really a lot of teamwork in this. I would recommend having more than one person, especially if you're going to take on this project. And it took a lot of time, but by the end of the day, we were done cutting all the keys to their dimensions. By no means were we experienced in this, and we had no clue what we were doing. But we just put our two brains together, and we made it happen. Um, so yeah, you don't have to be experienced, you just have to, you like, you know, how, like, cutting wood works and stuff. So having my dad there to help was really, really very beneficial to me. And then you can see this cool leaf blower shot blowing away all the sawdust. So that's cool. Woohoo! We have a whole keyboard of bars. I was really happy and this really just boosted my spirits and convinced us to go forward with the project. It kind of works. <laughs> so we had all these blocks that kind of made noise, but not really the noise that we wanted them to yet. So we had to tune them. In order to tune a marimba bar, you have to have the arch under the key to be the proper size, length, and shape in order to create the tone and note that you want. So there's a lot of cutting, there's a lot of sanding. So the next step to tuning the keys was cutting the arches. We used a bandsaw that we borrowed from our neighbor, and I would definitely recommend one if you can get your hands on one. So I drew the arches on each individual key, measuring out the dimensions so that the arch size would be relative to the key. I think it, I cut the bar into quarters, and then in the middle two quarters, that's where the arch was. So I learned later that this arch shape was not ideal for tuning. It tuned them all too low because we removed too much wood from the bottom. So we had to redo a lot of these. So to start with making the shape under the key, instead of making the arch right away, we just cut out a triangle underneath the key. Same length, same height, but just in a triangle shape instead of an arch shape. They must be Dutch. I've seen some people also remove wood in a rectangular shape. 
Uh, we did a triangle shape because it was just easier with the bandsaw to create that shape as opposed to a rigid rectangle. Uh, but just remember, whatever you do, if you are going to be making a marimba, following these steps to remove less wood rather than more. So these are all the keys after they have been cut with the rough arch with using the bandsaw. It kind of has that triangular uh, trapezoidal shape right now, but when we sand it, it will become rounder and look more like a marimba key and sound more like one too. You might notice how some of the keys have the edges curled up a little bit. We had to sand them up so that we could bring the note back up. So you can always lower the note by sanding the arch, but in order to bring the note back up, you can only do it so much by sanding the edges of the key. So we had to do that sometimes here. Uh, we're not perfect. We were just doing our best and that's okay. So the next step of tuning your keys is to sand the arch. So we used a belt sander, which was super, super helpful with this. Uh, it sanded them really quickly rather than using a palm sander or, oh my goodness, don't even try to just do it by hand. That would take forever. So belt sander is probably the way to go for sanding your keys. So this first stage of sanding is just the rough tuning. Your goal here is to get your note about 50 cents or more above the desired pitch because later when you have to drill the holes in the keys or stain them, it might change the pitch. So those 50 cents act as a buffer for how any later steps will affect the pitch. Later, we will fine tune the keys after all the changes to the pitch have been possibly made. It's really just the final step, so hopefully then you get them right on the note. I used a tuner to check the pitch of the key frequently. You want to make sure not to sand for too long because, again, you can always bring the pitch down, but it's more difficult to bring it back up. So I used a phone app tuner and it worked just fine. So here you can actually sand for two things or more. We were just sanding for the fundamental note the note that you hear, so if the key is for an A, you hear an A. But there's also an overtone that you will hear when you play a key. Usually it's not pronounced because it blends right in, but if you don't tune the overtone, it can be very obnoxious. So we weren't focusing on the overtone. For that, you wanna focus on how you sand the arches, how pronounced they are and whatnot, but we weren't focusing on that, so we were just sanding in the middle. If you wanna read more about the overtones, there's more in the sources that I have below. Yay, we finished rough tuning. Okay, so this part, in my opinion, was the most complicated part. We, I couldn't really find a lot about making the frame on the internet, so we did have to, you know, search for some plans and things that could help us to find these measurements. So you might notice that you see lines on the keys. There's two lines, one on the top, one on the bottom of each key. So in order to do that, we had to find the nodes. So there's a lot of information online about how you can find nodes for your marimba keys, uh, the popular method is the salt test, so you basically put it on two rubber bands uh, in a box, you know, somewhere it can float, and then you put salt on the key, and like you know about the average area of where you would think the nodes would be, where the nodes are basically where the holes go through for the string, uh, it's like the dead sound areas, there's something about it in physics, I don't know, but... You put salt in those general areas, and then you hit the key with a mallet, and the salt will go to the node areas, and that is where you should mark it, that is where it should approximately go over the frame, and that's going to help a lot in these frame measurements. So once we found all of the nodes of our tuned keys, we took all of the white keys, or the bottom keys, and we lined them up against this horizontal strut that we used as a rail for the frame later on. So once we had them all lined up, all bunched up, we used a half inch spacer to separate them half an inch apart each from each other. And then once they were all separated like this, we marked them on the strut above so that their outline was there on the rail and we could use it later to place them on the frame. So once we had all of our keys laid out against this strut, we had to make sure that they wouldn't move. So I enlisted my brother for help with this part. So basically what we did is we took a long piece of wood, a long straight edge, and we used it to find the average line of best fit of the top node lines. Once we had this line, we traced it in a distinct color, so using a colored pencil, so that we knew where it would be. Then we did the same thing for the bottom node lines. This helped us find where the keys would about sit on the rails 
and helped us getting a starting point for setting up the frame and the angles of the rails. So this is just a rough diagram because I couldn't find the original one. I just used like a buffer space above and below the bottom key of about half an inch, probably more on the bottom, just to make sure that the edge of the frame was going past the key on the bottom and that there was enough space between the top of the key and the bottom of the black key rail. So after a lot of adjustments, approximations, guessing and checking, we finally got our keys where we wanted them on the board. It helped that we had our top rails thicker than our bottom rails so that we didn't have to have anything standing them up. And there was just a lot of adjustment going on, moving rails, moving keys, making sure that they were in the spot that we wanted them to be. So this step was very important for us because it laid the foundation for how our frame was going to work. Uh, we wanted to make sure it was right, so we took a lot of time on this step. So we got all of our keys on the frame, and then we had to mark where each key was on the frame so that we could put them back if we needed to, and we could have guides for where the post should go later on for the frame. We also marked where we would need to drill holes and where we would need to make cuts for the frame. Uh, this step was very important because we don't want anything to change later on, even minutely. We want it all to stay the same, no matter what happens, we want to just be able to come back to this. So this was a very important step in finalizing, you know, our design of the marimba. So my dad then drilled the frame together. Uh, we left the keys on there just to make sure it didn't shift, and if it did, we could adjust it. Just the top and bottom keys for each end. Um, so yeah, uh, this was a bit difficult because we chose to use oak for our frame, which is very difficult wood to work with at times. See if I was right-handed, and I'm left-handed. So now we're gonna put the screw in. Uh, we're making sure the holes are lined up. So, you know, it goes all well, cause Oak hasn't been nice to us in this whole process. Then after this, hopefully the key will fit on. We'll see if it does. It worked. So we had to make sure that nothing shifted, nothing moved, so that this key would fit on here, and it did. Oh boy, I feel like this was definitely the hardest, most arduous part of this whole thing, and I didn't even have to drill any of the holes. It was just looked so difficult. I can't believe my dad did it so well in the end. So my dad had to drill all of these holes by hand in each key. It took a long time, especially because we paced it mostly over many weeks. He said it was very difficult to drill the diagonal holes. So you see this one that he's drilling right now has a diagonal brown line right there. And it's just difficult to keep it straight and even on one level, but have it go diagonal another way, especially when you're doing it by hand and when you're doing multiple one after the other. So this took a long time to drill, especially because the oak, you had to basically push the drill through. Again, oak was not being nice to us. so. It did take a while, again, uh, props to my dad for doing all of this. It was crazy, uh, I could have never done this, so he deserves a bunch of the credit for this project, for all the hard work he's put into it. Holy cow, man. Still drilling, and it's just one hole. Imagine 52 times two, 104. Oh my gosh. Mad props to my dad for being a superhero throughout this whole thing and just getting work done that I could have never done without him. He taught me things that I never thought I would learn along the way of making this whole marimba and it was just a really beneficial experience and I'm glad that I got to spend it with him. I can't thank him enough that he's stood by my side for all the struggles we went through with this. Next, we stained the keys and made them look pretty. This wasn't really necessary, but my dad was adamant about making sure this whole thing looked nice. 
so we painted them with this stain from Lowe's or something. It kind of smelled bad though, so uh, just a warning there. Oh boy, so now came fine tuning. We drilled the keys, we stained them, so all of the possible changes to the pitch have already happened, and we're going to fine tune them now so that they are actually the pitch that they need to be. No more changes are going to be made to the pitch after this, hopefully if we get it right. So yeah, I don't know why I look this weird doing it. But just like with rough tuning, I used my phone tuner app to tune the notes, and this time I paid a bit more attention to the overtones. So if I could fix the overtone, I did by just sanding that edge of the arch, but I was really just like, you know, trying to make it smooth. I checked each pitch before I started sanding to see how, about how much I needed to go. You kind of get the sense for how much you need to sand uh, for, you know, how much you need to lower the pitch the more you do it. Yeah, so I would just sit outside for like hours in the morning with a baseball base on my lap in a chair, just sanding this for hours. I had to replace the sandpaper so many times, but eventually we got it done, so yeah. Surprise! My dad's been building the frame this whole time, so I agreed if I handled the keys, he would handle the frame. So that was our agreement for doing this whole thing. So he was more experienced in woodworking than I was, and I was willing to look at the sound. So he was doing the frame this whole time while I was uh, fine-tuning the keys, and it turned out amazing. He put a stain on it, and he put wheels on it, and the top part can come out of the bottom part. He really outdid himself in designing this whole frame. It really looks amazing and it functions amazing. So you might notice uh, we did not use the, you know, traditional marimba forks or make our own aluminum forks. That's kind of crazy in our opinion. So we just got these eyelet screws from Lowe's. They work just fine. Um, we just drilled holes and then we screwed them in by hand. We had to make sure that they were screwed in straight, so we were careful to make sure we started it straight and then we screwed it in and we tightened it more using the leverage of a screwdriver. These work just fine and we chose to use these over uh, traditional marimba forks because it's just more practical, it's easier, it's cheaper. You do want to make sure your eyelet screws are tall enough and sturdy enough. We used this size, it was the biggest size that we could easily find, so it worked for us. And with that, our frame was finished. I'm ready for the keys to be strung on. I had to wipe off the keys uh, with like a wet paper towel because they had sand on them from sanding. I don't know, my mom wanted me to include this picture. Okay, so I placed all the keys in their spots. I uh, made sure to orient them so that the drill holes were like facing the right way. So, and then we started stringing it. I had strung the marimba at school, so this wasn't too difficult. Uh, we used these cool spring things to attach the end of the spring. Uh, there's specific springs that you can get for a marimba, but we just used these. We just tied them to the end hook. Um, yeah, you had to string each key and each eyelet. Pro tip, use a lighter to heat up the end of the string and then lick your fingers and straighten the string so that it's easier to push the keys. Sometimes we had to use this screw to make sure to get any gunk out that was like blocking the way in the holes. Uh, it was just a screw that fit in and we turned it and it got all the gunk out, so yeah. So we decided against using resonators because this instrument was just for practice. We didn't feel like we were gonna take this to any performances or anything like that. We are just going to have it in my room so that I can practice at home, especially when I don't have access to the instrument at school. Resonators were just another thing that we didn't feel like we needed to worry about for the purpose that this instrument was going to serve. And here's the end product! Woo! I'm so happy we got this done, and I'm really, really happy that I get to play my instrument again. I couldn't have asked for a better partner in crime to work on this with, and I'm so glad me and my dad got to work on this together over quarantine. Here's what it sounds like. Yeah, I'm super happy with it, and it's just for practice, so it doesn't need to be perfect. And that's been a whole learning thing throughout this process. It doesn't need to be perfect, and it's going to be just fine the way it is. It's going to work, and it's going to be playable. 
So we're still thinking about making a few adjustments, like fine-tuning some keys more, um, putting some felt on the frame so that it doesn't clunk when you hit it too hard. But yeah, so it'll always be a work in progress. We'll always be improving this. I'll always be working on it to improve my skills and all of that. But overall, it was just a really great experience, a beneficial experience. And I'm so glad that we got to do this and we decided to do this over quarantine.